So let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Mars workshop, Introduction to Mars. Uh, we'll be focusing on the Martian atmosphere today. This is a workshop uh, hosted by the Center for Space Science at NYU Abu Dhabi in collaboration with the UAE Space Agency. Before we begin, uh, please use the Q&A feature below to ask uh, any questions you might have. Please free, feel free to use uh, the chat box anytime to make uh, comments. So let me first start by introducing uh, Professor K.R. Srinivasan, who is the PI uh, of the Center for Space Science. He's the university professor and Eugene Kleiner Chair for Innovation at uh, New York University. He has appointments in three departments, uh, physics, current Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Tandon School of Engineering, before this, he has had prominent positions at Yale University of Maryland. He was the director of International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy and had positions at the United Nations. He has been a visiting professor at Caltech, Rockefeller University, Cambridge Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, among others. He's known for several important contributions to the field. He is the recipient of several distinguished awards, too many to mention given the time constraints. So Srini, uh, welcome. And uh, yeah, let's get started. Yeah, thank you, Dimitra. Uh, colleagues, uh, greetings wherever you are. I am very pleased to welcome you to this workshop on behalf of the Center for Space Science in NYU Abu Dhabi. As Dimitra said, the workshop is being organized jointly with the UAE Space Agency, and engineer Fahad will really do the actual welcome. I will introduce him momentarily. Let me say a few words about the purpose of the workshop. Dimitra has said this already, but a little bit more. 2020 has been a very eventful year for Mars researchers all over the world. UAE's HOPE mission, NASA's Perseverance, and China's Tianwen-1 were launched this summer, despite all the issues uh, with COVID, and all are on their way to Mars. There is no doubt that huge amounts of Mars data from these three machines will be available in 2021. It's important for all aspiring Mars scientists that they should have some background on what sorts of data will be available, how to make use of them, how to advance the science, et cetera. Researchers in our own center work on a number of problems related to stars and planets, with particular interest in the sun and its planets, especially space weather, impact on the Earth and Mars. With respect to the Mars, we are interested in the habitability and the atmosphere itself. We work with observational data while we also attempt to model the physical processes. Our goal is to develop local capabilities to analyze data from Mars missions, especially HOPE, and also future planetary science missions, such as Rashid, while collaborating with researchers around the globe. The workshop is just a first step in that direction. A series of workshops is going to be organized, gearing towards students and researchers, with the purpose of developing a planetary science community in the region. I want to thank all my colleagues who have made this event possible, the speakers especially, and also uh, Dr. Dimitra Atri. I want to thank uh, everybody for their kindness in sharing their expertise with the attendees. I now request engineer Fahad Al Mahiri uh, to add his welcome. As many of you know, he is the executive director of space sector at the UAE Space Agency and the chair of the Emirates uh, Space Innovation Group. He is thus very important for the UAE space efforts, and I am very grateful to him for having agreed to uh, do make these welcome remarks. Before uh, taking on uh, this present responsibility, he was the executive director for the business development at EDIC, which is Emirates uh, Defense Industries Company. Um, Mr. Fahad, the floor is yours. Enjoy the workshop. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Srini, for having me here today, and thank you very much, Demetra, for arranging this uh, together with the team at the UAE Space Agency. Um, 
it's really an honor to be here today, uh, you know, through the Center for uh, Space Science at NYU AD. Uh, I think this is the first, the first uh, webinar that we're actually having in this workshop series. So, uh, and I would really like to thank our international speakers today, uh, hailing from France, the US and the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm sure we will all be learning something from you all here today. Now, UAE is coming closer to its 50 year jubilee. Uh, it's, you know, the UAE was only five years old when our forefather, His Highness Sheikh Zayed, may God rest his soul, met with astronauts from the Apollo 17 mission. Uh, at that time, you know, this was almost 50 years ago, and the UAE, again, only five years old. His Highness put together a vision at that time, and there was already the understanding that space was going to be a part of the UAE moving forward. Um, last year, Azza al Mansouri marked a historical and monumental feat for the country and for the region as the first Emirati astronaut and the first Arab aboard the International Space Station. July 20th, the Emirates Mars mission was launched from Tanagashima Island. And, you know, it, it, it's it been uh, 140 days now, approximately. And uh, we know that it's traveled, I believe, more than 355 days to this point. Uh, I know that information because uh, we actually have uh, the MOI uh, prep meeting tonight. <laughs> it's probably going to last until around 11 p.m. Um, and so we only have about 125 million kilometers to go before the expected Mars orbit insertion planned to happen on the 9th of February, 2021, coinciding with the Golden Jubilee year of the Union. The governments today have, as they had in the past, always looked at setting visions. And the UAE government today is looking at the next 50 year plan. And I'm very proud to say that space is a part of that plan. It is embedded and the UAE is going to be known to have space as a legacy of the country and something that we will commit to and continue working towards in the next 50 years to come. Uh, evident to that you have the 2117 program uh, that has been put together um, you know, with the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center uh, so it shows the future and it shows the 100 year plan that had already been put together uh, in the past. Now the Emirates Mars mission will support to provide a complete picture of the Martian atmosphere and give scientists a deeper insight into the past and future of, our, of this planet, as well as our planet, and also take a look at Mars uh, and its potential uh, for life uh, for humans really to live on. And all of this will, of course, be contributing to humanity's understanding of the universe and how it formed. Uh, all of this is, of course, possible through such planetary data analysis. And driven by the passion of the UAE's wise leadership, the EMM is a real step forwards in the Mars exploration. And this is where we really aim to make sure that, you know, the information that is coming through is something that we can be proud of. Um, again, going back to the legacy point where it has been six years that the UAE has been working on the Mars mission. And in that time, we've been working on the data, what sort of data will be coming in. We've been looking at how we will be contributing and the new information that's gonna be coming in. As Srini mentioned, we have two others, two other countries heading to Mars right now. And if all that data can be made available, there is going to be a huge need for AI and computational power to be able to support all this. And in order to do that and use all that information effectively, it all comes down to the ability of the youth, of us, of everybody here and everybody joining us today to learn how to use all that data and look at the tools that are available to us to be able to use that data and really come up uh, with new insights, uh, prove theories, uh, and, uh, you know, maybe come up with even some new theories uh, based on the new data that will be made available. And it's really a catalyst for the new generation of Arab scientists and engineers uh, and an anchor project for the growing science uh, and, and space sectors. And to support this, of course, our leadership has always been pushing to support the youth and thriving in these capabilities. And so today uh, I'm really happy to be here and I'm proud to see uh, the faces that we have here as speakers, all of them known and recognized uh, from around the world. And 
you know, to our participants and our attendees here today. Uh, it is not just a show of information, but it's a course in a sense that we look to grow and the opportunity for you all to learn something and figure out how uh, to use data uh, to be able to support planetary research uh, in an effort to make the UAE a hub for this information, the new information that's going to be coming out. And as His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum mentioned before, the Emirates Mars mission will be a great contribution to human knowledge, a milestone for the Arab civilization and a real investment for future generations. So I really hope you all uh, you know, take part in this workshop. I believe I was told that uh, there will be a, a sort of a certificate that will be awarded for those that complete the series. Um, and so it's a great initiative by the, the uh, NYUAD and the Center for Space Science. And we look forward uh, to these continued series and uh, always remember that the sky does not define our limit when it comes to space, because to us, the sky is only the beginning. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. And I look forward to being a part of this workshop with you all here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fad. Very, very nice words. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Srini. Thank you, Engineer Fahad. Uh, are you able to see my screen here? Yes, uh, Dimitra, I will be here, but I'm going to stop video and uh, mute myself, okay? Okay, okay, sounds good. All right. All right, hi everyone. So I'm just going to give a quick introduction. Uh, as Srini mentioned that our, our center has expertise both in solar and stellar physics and in planetary science. So we are in a unique position to study the impact of space weather on Mars. Uh, so in case you were wondering uh, why uh, New York University is in Abu Dhabi, well, NYU now has a global presence in addition to a campus in New York. It has a campus in uh, Abu Dhabi and in Shanghai. And the interesting thing is that the three countries where NYU has campuses, all three have missions going on the way to Mars. So UAE has the HOPE mission, NASA's Perseverance, China's uh, Tianwen-1. Currently, all three of them are on their way to the planet. Uh, HOPE mission, as engineer Fahad just mentioned, it was launched in July from Japan. Uh, its uh, orbit is much, much uh, further away from uh, other missions. So for example, here uh, on the left, you see uh, missions such as MAVEN, Mars Express, NGS, and so on, they are much, much closer to the planet. They provide very high resolution data. But the problem is when, when you have high resolution data, you're also limited to a very small geographical location. HOPE mission uh, is going to be much further away from the planet. So it will give you an overview of the planet. So you can see the whole planet uh, in a single go. And that is uh, what sets apart this mission. So this is the latest uh, from uh, this afternoon, uh, the HOPE mission, uh, it, is, it has been launched uh, less than five months ago. And it, uh, it, it is on its way to Mars, in, uh, to Mars. It will reach the orbit uh, on February 9th, 2021, so in about two months. It is traveling at a speed of about 25 kilometers per second. So which means that if it were to travel between Abu Dhabi and Dubai, it will take just six seconds, so 150 kilometers. Uh, so Mars is the most extensively uh, studied planet. Uh, and uh, there is a reason behind it. I mean, it is such a fascinating place. So it started in the 60s, uh, mainly by efforts from the United States and USSR. There were several orbiters, landers, and now there are many countries involved, uh, UAE being the latest member. Um, and there is data available from uh, many of the past missions. There are several orbiters right now taking measurements, uh, including Mars Express, which will be discussed uh, later on. And so there is tons of data already available. Another thing is how to utilize that data. So one needs to understand the physics of what is going on. Plus one should also be familiar with how to analyze this data, what type of tools 
uh, to use and so on. And that was the reason behind this workshop. So why Mars? Why everyone is fascinated with Mars? Well, uh, a couple of years, a couple of billion years ago, Mars uh, was very similar to the Earth. It had liquid water on its surface. There's abundant evidence now. Uh, although I wouldn't call it a twin because its mass is about 10 times uh, smaller than that of the Earth. Uh, but it was very similar, the climate, uh, water bodies on the surface, and there is a chance that there might be life uh, on Mars. Uh, I mean, it's a hypothesis because there is water. So now the question is, how did Mars lose a majority of its atmosphere? And to lose the atmosphere, well, you need to reduce uh, the pressure of the atmosphere. And so space weather, is the main culprit on why that happened. And we know that because of all the different missions that have gone to Mars. So first of all, what is space weather? So just like we have weather on Earth, we have snowstorms, uh, rain, thunder, things like that. Sun is also highly active. And by the way, Sun is entering an active phase now. And Sun emits uh, charged particles, electrons, protons. It emits uh, extreme ultraviolet radiation. So you have radiation in form of solar wind, solar flares, coronal mass ejections where uh, the plasma is, is ejected. Um, because of the shock, these charged particles, proton can be accelerated to extremely high energies. Uh, these are called solar proton events. And all of this impacts nearby planets, such as the Earth. And on Earth, we are luckily shielded by having a thick atmosphere, we have a global magnetic field that prevents us from being impacted by you know day-to-day -day normal events. Um, some of the sectors impacted by uh, such events could be aviation, satellites, power grids, and so on. However, in case of a major event such as the 1859 Carrington event in which you were able to see these auroras or these uh, you know lights um, places close to the equator, uh, there is significant risk uh, to Earth. Uh, it can cause major disruptions worldwide, major social and economic impacts, which we understand now we are in the middle of one. And there are a number of studies which have estimated that just within the United States, there could be a damage of up to $2.6 trillion economic uh, damage. So President Obama, before leaving office, signed an executive order to prepare the United States in case uh, such an event were to occur. And a lot of researchers are now working on this. And I think other countries should also think in direct, that direction and you know, be prepared from these events. So coming to Mars, uh, what happens when these uh, you know, space weather phenomena, how it impacts Mars? Well. Uh, first of all, it can uh, alter the chemistry of uh, the Martian atmosphere, this energetic radiation, energetic protons, uh, UV, X-rays. Uh, they interact with the atmosphere. They can induce chemical changes. Um, a part of the atmosphere can escape, uh, leading to gradual erosion of the atmosphere, which we were talking about. And I will give a quick overview of this quickly. Also, you can have this radiation penetrate all the way to the surface of Mars and even below, and it can enhance the radiation dose. So if there, were, uh, there was life on uh, Mars, uh, this would be a factor. There are plans for astronauts to go on Mars. So this radiation dose uh, is uh, a significant factor. Now on the right, you see this uh, atmospheric escape is a very complex problem. So I won't go in too deep into it. I'll just give you a very quick overview of what this escape is, how it happens. So you can divide this escape into thermal and non-thermal escape. Thermal escape is basically this radiation depositing heat in the atmosphere of Mars. So you have lower energy uh, photons, charged particles, they deposit heat in the upper atmosphere. As the energy goes up, the radiation penetrates deeper, so it can even heat up the lower atmosphere of Mars. And as you know from Maxwell-Boltzmann equation that once you heat a gas, the velocity of its uh, constituents goes up. 
a fraction of uh, which uh, the velocity exceeds the escape velocity and the uh, escape to space. Another way this happens is called hydrodynamic escape, where you have all this uh, radiation depositing heat. Uh, this gas expands and a part of it escapes uh, to space. There is bulk outflow, so a bulk of the atmosphere, and it takes with it many of uh, the heavier components of the atmosphere with it. Uh, when it comes to non-thermal escape, uh, you have photochemical escape. So you have this radiation induced reactions that generate heat, which can be converted to kinetic energy of particles, which can lead to escape. You have a process called a charge exchange where you can have fast ions, let us say from solar wind. They interact with a slow typical particle in the atmosphere. There is a charge exchange process so that this neutral particle from the atmosphere is fast, it escapes, and the ion is slowed down. Then you have uh, this pickup uh, ion process. It happens in exobase, so very, very high up in the atmosphere at the edge of space where it interacts directly with the solar wind. And the solar wind can these pick up these ions and take it away with it. There is also a process called sputtering, where you have these fast ions and, uh, which can knock atoms out of the atmosphere. And there are many other complex processes I will not go into, but there are uh, sophisticated physical models which exist, uh, which have been modified to work on Mars, using which we can study uh, all these uh, physical processes and we can try to understand what we observe on Mars. Now I'm going to show you some results of this atmospheric escape. This is a very well-known results from NASA's MAVEN mission where they were able to escape and inter they were able to measure interplanetary coronal mass ejection, which was ejected towards Mars. And as you can see that in this paper from 2015, uh, the escape rate went up by about an order of uh, magnitude. And uh, MAVEN mission was able to not only measure the incident radiation uh, on top of the Martian atmosphere, but also what is happening on the top of the atmosphere, how its constituents change and so on. There was a study later on, a very similar study where you see uh, this radiation uh, uh, increase uh, the escape rate of uh, the Martian atmosphere by a factor of 10 to 20. Uh, now, even though this is a great result, there is a disadvantage and which I mentioned earlier that because uh, this mission is so close to the planet, you can uh, measure uh, these things in real time only in a short physical space for a short period of time. And so HOPE mission, which is going to be much, much further away, is going to see the entire thing. And so we'll uh, make use of both these missions Maven will take high resolution data while uh, Hope will take the full picture and we'll uh, then use it to better understand these escape processes. Now, even though I focused on Maven and uh, using EMM data, there are tons of data already available. ESA's most successful uh, Mars mission, uh, uh, Mars Express, has made major contributions to the field. So Dr. Kitov will talk about uh, the, what major contributions that uh, mission has made and how uh, all the students attending this can contribute. Then Dr. Yuan Miller is going to talk about the Mars Climate Database. Uh, it is the most well used, uh, most well known uh, tools uh, available to the Mars community. So uh, I think everyone should be familiar with this. And then uh, Dr. Luca Montabone will talk about everything that I didn't cover, which means everything that is happening on the surface of Mars, dust storms, how it leads to escape and so, uh, and so on, very complex uh, Martian climate. And so you will learn uh, these things today. So since uh, this workshop is geared towards students, I'm going to highlight some selected student research uh, that we did recently. So how does atmospheric chemistry is impacted by these flares? So on uh, the vertical axis, you have the altitude, uh, horizontal axis, you have the density. 
and you see that uh, this UV flux has been artificially increased, uh, growing uh, up to a factor of 10. Uh, and we just wanted to see how it changes uh, the density of different constituents as a function of altitude. And as you can see how uh, molecular oxygen, how atomic oxygen, how uh, it changes. And if you look closely, they are going in opposite directions. If you increase uh, EUV flux, O2 levels are going down, uh, but O levels are going up. And so you'll have to uh, read our paper to figure it out. Uh, then uh, recently there was a discovery of uh, proton aurora on Mars. Uh, there was a paper in Nature Astronomy uh, in 2018. On Earth you see auroras at nighttime, on Mars uh, you see auroras even during daytime. So this is because of protons impacting uh, and this is again from Maven. And some of our students are working on it. Uh, they have, they also observe so this blue line is the baseline uh, emission, uh, ultraviolet emission from IUVS instrument. And uh, the orange yellow line is the enhancement at about 140 kilometers. And so these protons then enhance, uh, they en deposit energy much uh, deeper in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, and so we are developing a number of tools to automatically detect such events. Uh, we are running numerical models to figure out you know, different mechanisms on how this happens. Um, uh, then we uh, recently worked on uh, radiation dose uh, on the surface of Mars. We have a huge database of solar proton events observed on Earth on Mars. And so we made use of this uh, data from radiation assessment detector on Curiosity rover. And we uh, basically took all the major events known to us uh, and we said, okay, what would happen if they were to interact with Mars? And so we scaled uh, the spectra to uh, Mars. And then as you can see how the dose uh, goes up as a function of uh, the fluence of these uh, uh, events. And from this, we can estimate uh, what type of uh, flare can induce what kind of radiation dose on the surface of Mars and how it can impact astronauts. So we had students from biology who also worked on how it could impact, you know, uh, astronaut health. So, so far, I've had the privilege of uh, working with two dozen students. Uh, they worked on different uh, aspects of planetary science, uh, mainly on Mars. We have several peer-reviewed publications, either published, uh, under review, and coming up. These students have made presentations at international conferences and so on. They are applying to grad school. And so if you're a student, if you want to get involved, then we have positions. So in 2021, you can be involved with us as a summer researcher. Uh, we uh, are requesting funds currently to have full-time positions. And so please keep checking the website of our uh, centers to see. You can contact us at this email address. Uh, we are in the process of expanding our mass research program. Uh, and finally, uh, I'm looking forward to 2021 when we'll have so much data from these new missions and then we'll work, in, uh, work on this in collaboration with uh, others who have worked on previous missions. So with that, I would like to thank you uh, for uh, joining us. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm now going to stop. Uh, I think I will answer questions uh, by typing. And let me share my uh, stop sharing my presentation. And uh, let me introduce uh, the next speaker. So, Dr. Tito, can you share your uh, screen? Yeah, so everyone, please use the Q&A feature to ask if you have any questions for me, I'll just type it out. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Dimitri Tito from the European Space Agency. So currently he's in his hometown in Moscow. So as you can see in his background. 
Uh, he is the project scientist of Mars Express, and many believe that this is one of the most productive ESA mission to date. It has made several major contributions to the field. Dr. Titov uh, is known for many uh, contributions in the field of atmospheric science of terrestrial planets, especially Venus and Mars. He is involved in many important roles in various space missions. So I won't go into more detail, and the floor is yours, Dr. Titov. Your microphone is muted, so. Yeah, I apologize. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, for uh, introduction and for inviting me to talk to the young people uh, in this webinar. And really, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce, um, uh, to give a brief overview of the Mars Express science highlights. And uh, just to remind you that Mars, Ex Mars Express actually stems from the Mars 96 Russian mission, uh, which, was, uh, which had an unsuccessful launch. It could not leave uh, the Earth's orbit in 1996. And after that, the European part of this uh, big and really huge mission at that time, they decided to convince European Space Agency uh, to go with a smaller mission under the Aegis of the European uh, Space Agency, and they did that. And um, uh, basically the uh, science which was formulated for that mission was comprehensive, a survey study of the surface atmosphere and plasma environment of Mars in space and time, and also uh, to have a uh, glimpses of uh, Phobos moon. So here what you see these are really different um, uh, areas in which Mars Express could contribute. So you can see that it is the mission which is survey mission. It's not really going into detail but look at the planet uh, as a whole. Well uh, the goals as you see are a bit similar to what HOPE is going to do uh, at Mars. Well, uh, this is the list of Mars Express uh, science instruments. And actually, we have now eight science instruments. All are working perfectly, except probably one or two channels, uh, which are really uh, minor things. So what we have is the um, uh, several instruments which are doing imaging. This is the high resolution stereo imaging, uh, imaging in the visible and near infrared uh, with, with spectral uh, capabilities. Uh, then the radar, which is doing subsurface and also sounding ionosphere. Radio science, which is doing the um, profiles of the neutral atmosphere and ionosphere. We have two spectrometers on board, uh, which are really covering very broad spectral range um, and doing uh, different kind of nadir observations and observations in the solar occultation uh, mode. Uh, we have an instrument that sniffs the um, uh, particles, ions, neutrals, electrons around the spacecraft. And we have a small uh, camera which first had the engineering goals, but now we have converted it into the uh, scientific instrument. So basically we can do very nice global context use of the planet. Well, I will go uh, through different themes of the Mars Express mission. And here at the top panel, uh, I don't know if you see my cursor so that I could point. Do you see it? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Good. So at the top panel, you see the uh, you see the products from the high resolution stereo camera. Well, uh, first of all, these are images in color with resolution of about 10 meters per pixel. And the second and most important capability and that we have the stereo imaging. So which allows you to convert these images into the topography or digital elevation models. Uh, so now uh, about 80% of the surface is covered with such images. And uh, really they, they are really giving us a lot of information about Mars. First of all, we see regional scale, we see uh, like on the left image, you see the um, outflow channels or uh, Valles Marineris, or you see craters. Uh, then you can reconstruct the topography. Also, you can count craters that gives you access to the uh, age of the terrain. 
Then on top of that, we have imaging spectroscopy, which gives us the global distribution of hydrated minerals and different other minerals, not only those. So here you see an example of such maps. And when you combine those uh, with the HRC images, basically you can derive what kind of processes which were running on Mars, say billions and billions years ago. And another surface instrument is the radar sounder, which penetrates to a few kilometers below the uh, surface of Mars and can provide you subsurface structures. So here you see the example of the, uh, of the study of the Southern Polar Cap, for instance. And we have now coverage of many, many uh, terrains on the planet. One of the examples, for instance, if you look at the southern polar cap, you can derive the volume of ice. And you see it's about uh, 1 million cubic kilometers, which is equivalent to about 11 meters of global ocean. And converted into the Earth terminology, it's about half of green line, Greenland, Greenland ice sheet. This is the uh, very recent discovery when we started using the Marsis radar in a little bit different mode we could get a much better resolution on the surface or subsurface better to say and what you see here uh, on the right hand side you see the patchy structure with blue spots these are the regions where the uh, reflections from the uh, from the water from liquid water was discovered this happens at the depths of about one to two kilometers. So this was the first discovery of liquid water because as you know, Mars cannot really keep liquid water on its surface because of its atmospheric conditions. But underneath a few kilometers of the ice shield, uh, liquid water can exist. Well, these are recent highlights. For instance, uh, the evidence, geological evidence for planet-wide groundwater system, which is on the right. You see, there were uh, several basins were uh, studied, and where you can see the deltas of rivers coming into these basins. Uh, then uh, we have uh, maps and catalogs of chemical alteration features. I showed you in the previous slide. We have uh, scrutinized the geology and composition of Gezero Crater and its vicinity for obvious reason, because this will be the, um, the uh, landing site for future rovers. And we are building now the digital elevation models. On the right hand side, you have the top level product uh, of HREC camera, uh, which provides you topography with, with about 50 meters per pixel resolution, which is about twice as good as the famous MOLA uh, topography. So now you see only two quadrangles of Mars. So we are continuously building this knowledge. And by the end of the mission, we will get, I hope, uh, full coverage uh, of the planet. Well, another topic which is probably close, closer to your heart is the meteorology and climate. And to see you, to show you one example of what uh, Mars Express can do, you see here the annual cycle of water vapor. Solar longitude is on the X Z, while the latitude on the planet is on the Y Z. And in color here, you see the evolution of uh, atmospheric water measured by SPICA. Well, if you simultaneously measure ozone, I will now switch to the similar plot of ozone. You see how these two, uh, how these two gases interact. During the polar night, you see a lot of ozone in the northern polar region, for instance. While the spring comes, Sorry, the spring comes and water is subliming from the uh, from the polar cap. You see lots of water here, and ozone and ozone disappears uh, in this region. So this is a lots of stories which you can tell uh, having this data. And just to give you an overview of the wells of the Mars Express data, here you see um, the um, uh, different different atmospheric parameters. The top panel is the water vapor, a piece of it I just showed you, the vertical red bars, separation between Martian years. So you see how the water cycle evolves from one year to another. On the bottom panel here, on the second from top, you see ozone, uh, then you see uh, oxygen, uh, then dust, 
uh, and temperature, again, dust and uh, ice opacities. All this is coming from the two spectrometers, SPICAM and, Mar and uh, PFS on board Mars Express. So you have all this uh, huge amount of data available for the community and for all the teams. Well, one of the recent debate was uh, existence of methane on Mars. And we are, we are looking at Gale Crater together with the um, MSL laboratory on the, on the surface. And in some cases, our measurements were uh, coherent. And in some cases, we saw methane with both PFS uh, on Mars Express and uh, MSL laboratory. Uh, but uh, in some cases, we did not. So really, this possesses a ch challenge for both observers and models. Uh, if we go, this is also one of the stunning images from uh, uh, HRC camera. You see dust storm in the year of 2018. You see part of the image completely covered with dust. Um, and then uh, this is how the visual monitoring camera, the context low resolution camera sees Mars. So basically on the left side, you see clean Mars and then, ten, and then one year after you see Mars, which is completely covered by this global dust storm. Um, the, uh, the context camera VMC, we call it, uh, also makes a lots of interesting meteorological observations. For instance, this is the famous elongated orographic clouds, which is cloud which is sitting on RCM Mons. And high resolution camera took this image, uh, took this phenomenon in the limb ge geometry. And here you see this cloud in limb geometry from HRSC. Well, um, one of the interesting results of the recent couple of years was the der derivation of the structure of the planetary boundary layer. It's very difficult really to go and sound two kilometers right above the surface, how they behave, how they evolve, what is the structure. And the, actually one of the few uh, methods that can be exploited is the radio science. And this particular paper exploits more than half, uh, more than 100 of radio occultation profiles made by Mars Express. And uh, with this, you could really derive the temperature uh, vertical profiles right above the surface. And what we are getting is that the um, depth of the, uh, of the boundary layer, which really ranges between three and nine kilometers, really uh, strongly correlates with the altitude of the, uh, of the location. For instance, here you see uh, the Tarsis bulge where you have uh, high altitudes. The depth of the boundary layer is about 10 to 12 kilometers, while in the deep, deep basins like Hellas, it really goes down to one, two kilometers only. And we can compare now with different kinds of models. For instance, here you see the comparisons with uh, Oregon GCM. So very nice set of data. Well, going higher up in the, uh, in the plasma environment, uh, we look at the ironomy. And this is one of the typical results and we have hundreds of these soundings. This is the vertical structure of the ionosphere basically showing you electron density versus altitude. And uh, each profile here, you see only one profile, but each profile is different. So basically you can really look at the evolution of the ionosphere, how it changes from daytime. This is example of the daytime, for instance, to the nighttime when the ionosphere really shrinks and you have very low electron density, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, these data are coming from the radio science experiment. And again, they're available for the community and really unique data set. Well, uh, due to statistics, due to now we are almost 20,000 orbits uh, of Mars Express, we can look at the statistics of crossing the bow shocks. I will try to run a video. So you see here the swarm of dots uh, flies Mm, on this image. So basically all they're, they're showing you the mm, crossings of the Mars Express uh, by bow shock. So you can really derive the information about the bow shock topography, about how the bow shock depends on uh, the solar wind conditions, on the UV flux, etc., etc. Um, 
And then um, another, yes, another interesting result is the dependence of total electron density of, on the crustal magnetic field. Here, for instance, you see at the top panel, you see the crustal magnetic field, which you see very patchy and it uh, condenses, so to say, in the, uh, in the mid latitudes of the southern hemisphere. In the bottom panel, you see electron density, which is, uh, which is delta electron density, uh, difference from the uh, conventional model of the Martian ionosphere. And what do you see clear, clear correlation between the delta electron density and the crustal magnetic field. This means that simply the um, ionosphere of Mars is really is sensitive to the, uh, to the crustal magnetic field. And we are observing this phenomena and we are looking at the statistics. Well, uh, ion escape, uh, as I mentioned, we have an instrument which is called ASPERA which is observing ion escape. And uh, on the background, you see a nice Mavian animation of this process. And what is measured, what is really useful, what is measured by Mars Express is for 16 years, we are monitoring both solar wind and uh, the ion population inside the, inside the magnetic boundaries. And um, uh, from this, you can derive the dependence of your escape rate on the UV flux, on the dynamic pressure of the solar wind and many other parameters. And this can allow you to extrapolate back in the history uh, of Mars and really understand how much water, how much material did the atmosphere lose uh, during its his during history of the planet. And surprisingly, and um, uh, surprisingly, that uh, this ion escape provides very, very small fraction of the escape of the total escape. You can explain only 10 millibars of water leaving the atmosphere with this mechanism. So something is missing, and uh, Maven is doing now perfect studies of um, many of other channels of escape and really uh, looking into in detail of this, of this process. Well, uh, one interesting question, a really global question that arises is, does magnetic field shield a planet or it provokes more escape from the planet? And here you see the, mm, here you see the uh, measurements of the ion escape, oxygen escape for Venus, Mars and Earth. Basically, you see that Earth, who is supposed to be shielded by magnetic field, apparently loses more material than uh, Mars and Venus, which are non-magnetic planets. So there is an interesting questions for physics for mechanisms of escape here. And again, so I'm pointing to the comparative planetology. Uh, comparison of these terrestrial planets um, really gives you a lot of thoughts uh, how the uh, how the planet evolves, how the atmosphere evolves. Well, uh, we're doing Phobos investigations simply because Mars Express orbit allows us to approach as close as 50 kilometers to the moon. And uh, so we are doing now images uh, of Phobos with uh, approximately five meters per pixel resolution. We're trying to observe Phobos and successfully with other instruments, spectrometers, to see mineralogical inhomogeneity on the surface of Phobos. With particle instruments, we try to sound the moon with radar. These are really very fresh campaigns which are doing now. And what I wanted to show you also, there are tools and different databases which have been developed by the Mars Express community or for the global planetary community. And here you see Mars Climate Database about which uh, I suppose Juan will tell you in the next talk. You see the planetary surface portal to see, to visualize the surface properties, spectral properties, distribution of minerals. You see model and database plasma environment and many other things, all the available uh, in the Mars Express team and the broader in the community. So please do not hesitate to ask and to use them as well. Well, uh, coming to the end of the talk, uh, Mars Express, despite of this age, I mean, it's more than 20 years from its design to the present moment, 
we still have a lot of um, interesting and unique features among the flotilla of uh, Martian spacecraft. Well, for instance, from the orbit point of view, we cover all local times. We have Phobos and calendars. We have uh, payload capabilities, which other uh, payloads do not have, other spacecraft they do not have. Uh, Mars Express really provided longest continuous record of climate and data parameters and plasma parameters. And uh, finally, what... the Mars Express status, as you know, the spacecraft is almost uh -huh. 16 years uh, operating in space. I think Since that I'm cut already. We are in gyroless mode, but spacecraft is still in good behavior, health, and providing good information. The mission extension. Uh, is approved now till the end of 2020. Extension of the end of 22 is no, no. to be confirmed. I'm not I think sure what's happening. I should stop here, yes. Yeah. And we expect this decision to be to happen in October 2020, hopefully. And so we expect new... Uh, sorry. Okay. So I, 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 I uh, jumped to the last because it was an audio. Sorry, I did not remove it, this audio, but you saw that uh, Mars Express in, is in good health. Uh, so we have extension till the end of 2022. We're looking forward for further extensions, but basically all the instruments and the spacecraft, they're working fine. And with the final slide, really, I would like to send you greetings uh, to all the HOPE mission, to students, to people involved who are really, um, well, expecting exciting mo moment of the arrival at Mars and good luck and success um, to you and uh, I, I hope we will meet uh, with data analysis on this. Thank you very much. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah, that was a great overview of the mission. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, can you see the chat? Uh, just a second, I uh, chat, uh, uh, I saw it, uh, question and answers, that's what. Or I can, okay, I can read them to you. So there is a question from uh, uh, Noura Alamari. Uh, is there any specific time for the Mars dust? Is it happening during a fixed time during the Martian year? Or if so, which season these global this global dust happens? Yeah, well, you see, uh, we we have of course local dust storms, which are more or less distributed, and especially during the summer uh, or springtime in the northern hemisphere, uh, lots of vivid events. But speaking about the global dust storms, uh, yes, we have certain seasons, and mainly it corresponds to the uh, to the uh, summer in the southern hemisphere when Mars is really closer to the sun when the surface is hotter, but uh, we really, we do not see that every year it repeats. So it's some kind of statistical processes, process, as I understand the nature is not yet clear, uh, but not every year. So 2018 was really remarkable uh, dust storm and we had really enjoyed observing this from space. Probably it was much harder on the surface as we know from spirit uh, faith. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from Joel Eldo. So there are two questions. First one is, what were some of the challenges faced in terms of computing uh, data from these uh, Mars mission? Well, uh, it's of course the challenge, yes, to have the data and ESA as an agency is responsible for archiving. And we're always expanding this area simply because we need more people, uh, more disk, uh, more computer power. Uh, but frankly, I see as a project scientist the, the, the challenge uh, to find people who are working with the data because the pipeline of doing the spacecraft operations, sending data back, first processing, primary processing, and putting them on the disk is more or less developed. But uh, what is needed really to people, people who are really coping with the data, who are really extracting science, and writing papers. And this is the call to all young people who are listening now, really come and take these data because they are really pearls. And uh, so we hope that you will be interesting. While even working with HOPE mission, you can look at the old mission comparing this. This is the most effective uh, way of doing science. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, his next question was, uh, can we incorporate something uh, such as a magnetosphere to make Mars more habitable in the coming years? Uh, well, it's probably difficult. You need really to bring a lots of uh, a lots of material. First of all, uh, volatiles uh, like oxygen, uh, like water, and uh, I don't know if magnetosphere or changing something uh, to the magnetosphere will help us. Right. Because now you see, you see, we have only one percent of the uh, of the pressure which we have here on Earth. So you need to add about hundred times of what is now in the Martian atmosphere. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tito. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so there was a question about Mars uh, Climate Database and our next uh, speaker yes. is going to talk about it in great detail. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, he will be answering your question. So let me introduce uh, our next speaker, Dr. Jörn Milou from LMB uh, in Paris, France. Uh, he's well known in the field of planetary atmospheres. He has made uh, several important contributions to the study of the Martian atmosphere. Uh, his tool, which he has developed with his collaborators, the Mars Climate Database is used extensively by researchers worldwide. And it will be a great opportunity for all the students to uh, get to know about this tool. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's all yours, yeah. Thank you for the introduction. So yes, I'm going to talk about the Mars Climate Database, everything you want to know about Mars Climate Database, hopefully, uh, which I don't develop alone. It's a, we're a big team of people uh, led mainly by Francois Forget. And, uh, but lots of people are involved in, in this project, which is an ongoing project. It's been almost 20 years now with ver ver various versions of the MCD. So uh, first of all, what is the Mars Climate Database? So you have to understand it's a database derived from global climate model simulations, GCMs, that's what we call them. Uh, I'll go back to this in the next slide, don't worry. Uh, and the second bullet here is that it's really a tool intended for users. So it could be for engineering applications like uh, studying for future missions, preparing instruments or preparing entry descent landing studies, as well as for doing scientific work uh, where usually you analyze observation or you use information complementary to your observations to make better sense out of them. And that uh, this uh, climate means atmosphere, of course, this atmospheric database extends basically from the surface to the exobase, so basically up to space. Uh, so as I was uh, saying, uh, what we do at LMD, we do also data analysis, but in this particular case, I will really talk about numerical models, about GCMs. So we uh, try to build a, a virtual a numerical Mars behaving like the real one, which is observed on what we used, we used to saying on the basis of universal equations. So we can debate a long time about what is really universal. But what we mean here is basically that we just describe the ongoing physical processes we assume might be at work on Mars. We code the, them in numerical models, and then we just let the system evolve and see what happens. And of course, I really uh, like this picture because here you see that we always have to start from reality. Reality is Mars. Mars is then observed. And once you observe Mars, you want to know more about it. So of course, you use the observations. But the true strength of a numerical model is that you will, of course, be able to compare with observations you have, no matter how scarce they are, that are or may be. But you also have then access to hidden variables. For instance, if your, your satellite is observing temperature, you can use your numerical model. If it's good enough, it will give you temperatures as well. And if they match the observations, then the added feature is that in your model, you also know about the winds, the chemistry, and many other aspects. Okay. And this can help then build better observ observers or observations and, and so on. So it's very virtuous cycle. So speaking of cycles, uh, you've heard about uh, Mars already. And uh, it uh, hosts uh, many important cycles. Uh, 
main, the main ones would be the CO2 cycle and dust cycle, along with the, the water cycle. And of course, if you want to model Mars, you'll need to model all of them. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit in some details on some of these aspects. Uh, what I mean uh, by you need to model them is you need, again, to represent all the physical processes at work. And here in this very busy schematics, you, I'm not going to go through all the arrows in which the, the main message here is that you have a mutual influence of every of these cycles with the rest and atmospheric circulation. That's what the main bit here is about. But even then, as we do in our model, if you add then the photochemistry or the upper atmosphere or thermosphere processes, they also are linked to the, to the rest of the system. So you need to really model the system as a whole. At some point, you need inputs to your model, just like topography, for instance. We, don't, uh, we, we assume the present topography. We don't resolve it in the sense of using equations. Um, but uh, once it's there, it impacts on the circulations and, and so on, and then we take that into account, and that will have an effect on various cycles, the circulation, and hence the photochemistry and the upper atmosphere and everything. It's all, it's all linked, basically. So one very important uh, thing, we've already had some questions about dust, and one of the most important, the, the two main cycles which basically dictate what the climate is going to be about on Mars are the dust cycle and the CO2 cycle. So I'll touch a bit on those more than the rest. Uh, here is an illustrative example of uh, Viking lander observations at different days during its mission. So it would render on the surface of Mars and very clearly depicting, depicting that from a day to the next, the sky is more or less loaded in atmospheric airborne dust. So you have some dusty days and then less, more clear sky days and so on. So um, how is that important? Well, this dust has, has very strong radiative impact. Basically, to put it bluntly, more dust in the atmosphere means warmer temperatures, okay? This is what this small plot here shows, temperature versus altitude in various cases. If you assume an extreme case where there's absolutely no dust on Mars, which is of course not, not the, the case, if you have a little bit of dust, you still you already get, for instance, at 20 kilometers, you're already 40 kelvins warmer because you have a little bit of dust in the atmosphere, as shown here in the, in the clear sky pictures. And again, if you then assume this is from the model, so you can really put as much dust as you want in your model. That's another advantage of models. You can really play with the various parameters to understand the physical processes at work. So if you put more dust, you see that you heat up a lot more your atmosphere at 20 kilometers still. You gain another 30 kelvins or so just by putting some dust, a dusty atmosphere. And if you really put lots of dust, you even see you can go up to uh, even higher temperatures, at least at some altitude. And here I emphasize when I say you put dust, you, you heat up the system, it's to some extent. It's true when you add dust. But then when you go into a dust storm, uh, so very obscure times, then you have screening effects. You see you heat up a lot the atmosphere at 20 uh, kilometers, but you're shielding the rest, the lower part of the atmosphere, and then it starts to be cooler. So it's not that simple, but from this, I hope I've clearly demonstrated that dust is the main driver of the, the atmospheric uh, cycles on Mars. So if you want to model what's happening, you need to actually uh, guide or impose that onto a numerical model, because there are some work uh, on trying to compute this stuff consistently, but it's really very nonlinear, very complex. So what we do in our models <clears throat> is that we, fortunately, there are some observations, and Luca Montaboni in the next talk will talk a lot more about that. So here I just skim through very quickly. So what, what are these plots about? So this is uh, from North Pole to South Pole, and the rest of the strip is one full year, solar longitude going from zero to 360, so along the whole orbit. And then this is one year, Mars year 24, and then the next and the third and so on. And uh, there, was, there were some questions in, in the chat. So it gives us uh, some information about a diurnal uh, yearly cycle as been discussed already. So first half of the year is a more clear sky and a heavy year dust load during the second half of the year. But what's important also is that 
it changes from year to year. There's a yearly variability. One year on Mars is not quite the same as the next one. Well, not always. If you look at these years, for instance, you can see Mars year 31 and 32 are quite similar from one year to the next. It's quite repeatable with some variations if you start to zoom in. But in some cases, so here I showed just two years, Mars year 25 and 28, you see this red, red is a lot of dust. And here you have global dust storms. I mean, you've seen nice pictures about these where really the system shifts to uh, something completely different, where the atmospheric is loaded with lots of dust, lots of winds and picking up the dust and putting it in the atmosphere. And it takes literally months for it to die down slowly. So this, uh, of course, this from one year to the next, March year 24 to 25, you'll say there's a big difference from what's happening in these two events. And then again, when you go to another year. And it's still not well understood why you have these global uh, events. You can see they're not quite repeatable along with time. Although we've only monitored last Mars years, maybe last 12 Mars years at most. So we're not really, we don't have a catalog long enough to really be able to make statistics about when, when these can occur. So this means that in, we'll have, this will have impact on the modeling. So uh, going back to the Mars Climate Database, we need to model the, as I've said already, the system. And uh, I'll touch this on the second part of my talk. We make it available to people. We have an online web interface. I hope that I will have, uh, I will finish my talk soon enough to give you a small demonstration right afterwards. And it's really used by very many people around the world. Uh, so again, really to insist, the GCM gives you, because it's a model, it gives you access to information everywhere on Mars in the atmosphere about the pressure, the density, the temperature, the winds and so on, and all the species and the water and the CO2 dry ice at the surface or that kind of things. I won't go through the whole list because the model includes all these processes. But running a model is really complex. So the idea is you just want the final product. It's basically like when you want to know what the weather is going to be tomorrow, you uh, turn on your TV, go to a weather channel, and you have the information. You could also have run your own model describing the, the weather systems on Earth and so on with all the right equations and do your own forecasts. Well, it's, it's kind of that, that kind of thing. The MCD is more convenient because it's already the system, the simulations have already been done, basically. Uh, so I'll now address more uh, technically some points of, uh, of the MCD with some illustrative examples. So I've talked about dust a lot, and I hope I've convinced you that you need to know the atmospheric dust content to be able to predict what's going on on Mars. As I've shown you, it's very erratic and it's not well uh, constrained. So well, if you want to model it, you have to do different scenarios. And this is an illustrative example. So here it's a profile from the entry probe opportunity of temperature to achieve temperature. And here we have what we call Mars climate database scenarios, which are basically how much dust you put in the atmosphere. I have a slide afterwards on how we determine this, these scenarios, where overall you see, and as I've shown you in a, a few slides away, if you put a little bit of dust in the atmosphere, you end up being quite cold. If you put what we think is the average regular best guess amount of dust, you get something much closer. And if you put lots of dust, like during global dust storm, you're way too warm. And actually, as I've shown you, we have scenarios for given years. So in the MCD, we, all, we do these synthetic scenarios, best cases, basically, best guess cases. And we also provide for the observed year. So opportunity landed during Mars year 26. So if we run the scenario, you see it's close to the climatology. It's slightly dustier, as was observed at the time. So it's slightly warmer and closer to the observation. Uh, so how do we build these scenarios? We just combine. So again, these are the plots I've already shown you about the yearly evolution of dust. We just take all these and we average them, removing the uh, global uh, planetary encircling dust storm cases to get a typical climatological year. That's what we get by do, to get, create the climatology. And at the same time, because we have all this data, we can also look when it's minimum over the whole set. And then we create a climatology of just the lowest dust ever observed, but still based on observations. 
And we can also build uh, for a given location and time, uh, the dustiest case that was ever observed. And then we have a third scenario. And that's how we build these things. Uh, so it's not just dust that matters. Uh, because if you go high up in the atmosphere, so here it's the same plot as before, but this time uh, the previous plot I showed you was up to 90 kilometers. If you extend into the thermosphere, then of course what happens in lower atmosphere has some importance, but what really uh, is the main driver there is the extreme UV input from the sun. So again, this is an input when you're looking at the atmosphere. It's something that comes from outside. And uh, here you have many different years, and you, I, it shows for these specific case that really depending on the, on the Martian year you're studying, the temperature in the upper thermos, in the thermosphere is going to vary a lot. And this is because, uh, as stated here, you have a, a yearly 11-year uh, Earth year cycle of the sun. The sun is not just a light bulb. The sun is a big ongoing explosion, and it's very quite variable. And actually, I can show you the next plot here. Here, it's uh, so E10.7 is a proxy, basically, for the activity of the sun. So these are Earth years going from 1996 to 2016. And then the colored bit are uh, Martian years to, to make the correspondence, because Martian year is roughly two Earth years. And you see that the, this is a very varying, strongly varying activity from a year to the next. So again, if just as for the dust, if you want to model different cases, either you model the actual observed cases, and that's in the MCD, or you can also do some uh, general minimum average or maximum extreme UV cases. And again, we just use the, the data to figure out the correct values for our minimum, average, and maximum scenarios. Um, so I won't go into much de more details on what you can get from the MCD, except from the little bullets I want to show you here, is that uh, you, it also provides some means to reconstruct the day-to-day -day variability. Remember, it's a climatology, <clears throat> so it's an average weather so you, of course, will be interested in more local phenomena or meteorology and so on. And it provides that way you need to reconstruct the variability. And we have the tools in the MCD to do that. We also have some tools to extract higher resolution compared to the GCM model, model uh, simulation uh, fields. Uh, I won't go into technical details uh, about that because uh, I want to spend a little bit of time on, OK, it's very good. You can believe me. Trust me. We have a great model. It uh, depicts Mars. But actually, how do we know that? Well, it's because we compare with observations. And this is really an ongoing work. It's a never-ending work because you get more and more data as missions continue. And that's a good thing. You never have enough data. Uh, and you have new missions looking at things differently with different instruments. So of course, we spend most of our time always comparing to, to, to the observations. This is just a short list of some of the uh, comparisons we've done. And what's important here, here, important here is all the little dots here about all the ongoing uh, comparisons we're, we're making. So for instance, to go back to the CO2 cycle, which I have not talked to much about so far. So what do we mean by the CO2 cycle? Well, on Mars, it can get pretty cold so that in the polar regions, mostly uh, during the polar night, you will have the atmosphere that will condense into uh, CO2 ice, so dry ice directly from uh, gas to solid, and in huge amounts. And this will change the overall global atmospheric pressure. And this is what you see here. So again, solar longitude over 360 degrees is one full year. And here we just keep going for until the next year. That's why it goes beyond 360. And this is the pressure observed by Viking Lander 2. So it's another probe uh, on the surface of Mars. And you see that these huge changes in surface pressure are due to the CO2 cycle. That means the polar regions degassing or condensing uh, the global atmosphere. And of course, the model needs to represent this quite well. This is one thing. The other thing you have to see here also is you see all these dots are diurnal averages. So you see from one day to the next, you can have huge changes at, the, at some specific time of years, for instance, here. You have lots of waves activity, basically weather systems. And from one day to the next, the situation can be very different. Of course, the MCD, it's a climatology, so you just get the average behavior from there. 
okay? But you have to know that there's also, uh, there can be some uh, weather effect. And that's very important when you compare observations to a climatology. An observation, unless you rebin it or average it, is always a given point uh, in space and time. And here, what we also show is there's a change. Here, there was a global dust storm. I've talked to you about the, uh, these uh, global climate encircling dust storms, where, where the whole system shifts to a different uh, behavior, basically. And we recover this when we shift also to a dust storm scenario uh, in the MCD. So this was quite a while back uh, in March 12, 13. But we also have uh, pressure sensors on, for instance, on board uh, Curiosity, so much more recent times, March 31, and ongoing and to this day, basically, measuring pressure. And here it's just over one year. But again, we show that uh, the, we do find uh, properly reproduce the observed uh, CO2 cycle and the variability also uh, observed by REMS on Curiosity or from, from the MC scenarios. Uh, another example with temperatures. Uh, so here on this uh, busy slide, uh, you can just focus on one of the two plots. It's basically we compare with uh, test observations which measured temperature here at a given uh, pressure level, which is altitude, which is where basically test was most sensitive. So we, we try to really compare uh, when there's uh, best possibility to compare. And what we do is for every observation, we compare with the MCD. And sometimes it's too warm, it's too cold, depending on, on the case. And we keep the information. And then we just build statistics. That's what you see in the red line. And you, the one thing you see is that, first of all, it's pretty Gaussian, because that's uh, the blue line is a Gaussian fit to the data, which tells you that, on average, we're uh, just a couple of Kelvin too warm with a given RMS. And that, again, is important. I've already touched on, on that is if you just compare one observation with the MCD, you might find a 10 degrees difference. You might seem high or 10 or 15. But again, you have to look at things statistically. And that's when you really investigate all the big data set together that you can really may, uh, retrieve some information about uh, is the model good enough or not. And for instance, if you look at the nighttime data, so this is 2 AM data and this is 2 PM data, we also are very happy because we have a nice uh, fit uh, to almost uh, the same average temperature as was observed over over two full years, uh, well, one and a half year by by TESS. Uh, this is also uh, good to uh, inform you about the strength of the MCD scenario. So when I compare to the TESS data, I use the climatology scenario the, uh, from the MCD. This is the plot I just show you. This is uh, this was you was the red line, but if now I compare to the MCD cold scenario or warm scenario, then I get of course different distributions, and if there's not enough dust in the system, we're systematically colder than the observations, and if we put too much dust in the system, we're systematically warmer than the system. So this is important because it really shows that you bracket the reality with the MCD, and that's really something we want to do uh, to be able to give a, a general case and some more realistic extreme cases. And actually, you can even do the same exercise, but this time focusing on the global dust storm that occurred during Mars year 25. And then if you compare to the Mars year 25, you see you're within a few Kelvin of the observations. So you're quite happy, the model works well. But if you had used the warm scenario, that's very dusty atmosphere, but not quite a global dust storm, you see you're still too cold by 12 Kelvin. But if you use the MCD global dust storm scenario, which is meant to be very extreme, but still representative global dust storm, then you're 12 Kelvins to warm. So again, you see that you bracket the reality. But again, when you bracket the reality, what, what reality do you want to bracket? Do you want to bracket an average Mars year, or do you want to bracket some specific significant uh, planet-wide event? That's always an important thing to consider when you're comparing observations and models. And I'm reaching my last slide. So I hope I've convinced you that the MCD is really a convenient tool to, uh, to both study Mars by itself, but also to compare to observations and also to prepare missions and so on. So one thing I've only slightly described is that uh, it's, 
it's distributed as software. Basically, uh, the root of it all is a Fortran routine that you you want to plug in with your own code, and then you call the climate database, and it does all the right interpolation. You just query about, I'm at this location, this time of year, this kind of scenario, what's the temperature, what's the wind like, and so on. What's the variability, what are, what are the chemical components, uh, and so on. And then if you want to draw a profile, you'll have to integrate it, interrogate the MCD uh, to, do, to build your own profile of data. Or if you want to map, you'll have to do the same, this time in a 2D grid. And of course, not everyone uses Fortran. So we also provide some uh, other languages, interfaces to the Fortran code so that you can really make, basically use it with your own tools. So this is what we call the full or expert version because you need to code, you need to program stuff, but you can get all the information you want. But also, and I, I'll, if I have allowed, I will spend one or two minutes describing uh, the online web version, which is a, a limited kind of form of the Mars Climate Database at this address, where you can really uh, investigate the data and have some quick plots and values. And um, the best is to just, uh, do I have the time, Dimitra? <laughs> yeah, please go ahead. OK, great. So I will share uh, my browser. Where did it go? Ah, I lost it. Uh, maybe here. Yes. So if you go to www.mars.lmg.uco.fr, you will actually land on this page. But here, uh, you will be able to click there and just hear this information if you want to order the full version. But if you want to do the web, um, to look at the web page, uh, it's here. So there are many buttons you can click on. So I won't go into all the details, but just the main ones. For instance, you need to specify a date. So it could be in Martian time. In case you're still one, you're not quite sure what we mean. We have some links, so I will open it here about the Martian season. So I told you it's a 360 degree cycle around around the as uh, the orbit, how long each lasts, and so on. There's some information there. And, and a given local time on Mars. Or you can go, especially if you want to compare to a given observation and you know, but you have the Earth date of when it, when it was done, you can here, you can switch. By default, it's the current time, but you can change uh, to any date. Then you need to specify the location. So here, for instance, if you want to map, we'll take all longitude, all latitudes, and maybe let's say uh, 10,000 meters above the surface, let's 10 kilometers above the surface. And then you pick which variable you want to see. So you can have multi-plots, but we can just take one. For instance, temperature is very useful. And then you click on Submit. And here, basically, it's running the MCD interface in the background, hopefully for not too long, because it's querying the MCD point-wise, and it draws the map here that you get. So this is uh, for the given uh, Julian date. Uh, so today, right now, basically, what the climatology scenario would predict as temperature 10 thousand meters above the surface okay so if you uh, so this is good for a quick glimpse of the data basically what are the ranges of temperature or if you want to see your profile you can also get some ascii data by clicking here but again here you're reaching the limit of the system so we picked the size of the grid for you and so on if you really want to manipulate the data uh, it's much better to have the full version of the mcd to play with okay for instance, if I just want to look at the profile, uh, if I so here you have some presets that you can use. Of course, you can enter longitude, latitude. But if, for instance, you want to go to the uh, Pathfinder site, it prefills here latitude, longitude. And here I can specify I want to look at what happens between uh, zero and twenty kilometers. Again, let's look at the temperature. And here this time it's a profile. And this is the temperature, OK? Because at this time of year, you're pretty much uh, in the polar night. So it's very cold, especially near the surface, OK? And so I really encourage you to play a lot. So you can do lots of things. You can specify which scenario you want to use. Uh, you can change the dates. Uh, you can pick from many, many fields. I show you temperature, but you have pressure density, wind, 
surface pressure, surface temperature, dust mass mixing ratio, etc., etc., etc. Again, one word of warning: this is a climatology. So if you want to, if you draw a plot of what's going on one day and the next, they will look very similar, of course, because you just have the uh, annual evolution, okay, of the system. Uh, and I think I will stop there and take questions. Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. That was a great presentation and MCD is, uh, even the web interface is so easy to use. Five out of five stars if it were an app. Thanks. Yeah, so there are many questions. Please go to the Q&A feature. Uh, a lot of questions. Over the chat. Okay, I'll go to the Q&A first. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Tito, there were some questions for you too. So if you want to go and the spectrum of spectrometers on board the satellite, I leave it to <laughs> to the experts. Um, from Nura Alameri, can we model make a model that can predict stages of the ionosphere? Uh, yes, so there are uh, some ionospheric models. They they exist. Uh, and uh, we do a bit of ionosphere in, in our model again. The question then is uh, which kind of ionospheric um, um, processes you want to look into. Uh, if it's just uh, neutral to ions, it, it works well. If you want to do ions to ions, then you need very short step time steps and modeling becomes very, very complex. But it, it's, uh, it, it's feasible. Some people work on that actually. Uh, I think the other question is also from Mars Express from Jing Xiao about observations for post processing. So I leave that also to Dimitri. Uh, then Danny McCulloch, is there any way of quantifying the amount of dust across altitude within a column uh, using the LMD? You mean the, the GCM? So, yes, uh, you, we do provide uh, the vertical distribution. But um, that's one of the weak points of our model. So if we compare the vertical distribution of dust we get uh, in our model currently, current version, and we compare them, for instance, to MCS, uh, Mars Climate uh, Sounder, which sees detached layers in the model, uh, the model does not generate yet uh, detached layers. So overall, to first order, we do have the right uh, the right amount of dust in the, in, in this, and the right distribution. I mean, it's still, it's mostly uh, near the surface, but if we look in the details, we're not quite there. Uh, we need, when we're currently working a lot on that, on better modeling uh, with uh, subgrid case processes like crooked dust storms, uh, the effect of dust injection, which actually rise up to maybe 30 kilometers as seen by, by the Mars uh, Climate Sounder. Uh, I have a question for, can dust be treated to make it suitable for Mars on li uh, life on Mars? I'm not sure I understand your question uh, because uh, dust is not really the problem uh, for life on Mars. Conditions are very extreme. It's too cold, uh, low pressure, uh, radiations and so on. Uh, dust is not a, a big problem basically on that point of view. Uh, then there's another question for uh, MC is great for past observations. Well, no. <laughs> uh, so the MCD again is the product of the GCM simulations. We do our GCM simulations, and there we can we can do uh, many things. Uh, we can even do past climates and so on. So uh, if you're looking at the climatology, can, you can do a lot with, with the MCD. Uh, but if you want to, to uh, I assume what you meant, mean by control change is, is yes, you want to do not one of the given scenarios, then you need to run the GCM, not the MCD. And then that's very, well, that's, that's a bit of work, uh, but our, our GCM is open to anyone who wants to use it. We're very happy to share it. So you can, you can ask us, uh, no problem. I, we can guide you to using it. But I must say, it's not very user-friendly. It's really, it's a research instrument, a research tool. Many people are co-developing it. 
And which leads me to the next question, what is Fortran? Fortran is a, a language, a low level language. For, it comes from a Fortran means formula translator. So it's extremely efficient for computational work for HPC, high performance computing, running on, on big computers, uh, multiprocessors and so on. All right, thank you. I think uh, we have a few more questions, but let us uh, do this via typing. So thanks again for the great presentation. Uh, let us move on to our next speaker. Uh, Luca, can you share your screen? Sure, can you hear me by the way? Yeah, yeah. So we have Dr. Luca Montaboni from Space Science Institute in Boulder, Colorado, but he lives in France. His area of expertise is the dynamics of dust storms on Mars and the connections with the atmospheric circulation. He has worked with large European Mars project, carried out data analysis for ESA missions such as ExoMars, Trace Gas uh, Orbiter. Uh, he is currently doing research with multiple satellite observations and planning aerostationary satellite missions to Mars. So, Luca, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, do you see uh, my screen, uh, your full screen? Yep. Good. Okay. So, let's. Uh... Let's start with this presentation. Uh, the title is very ambitious. You know, I want to unveil the long-term record of meteorological events on Mars so using uh, different observations from uh, uh, NASA spacecraft. Uh, of course, I only have uh, 25 minutes, as I understand. So uh, I cannot really give you all the details. I will, I will just give you a few examples and um, we we'll try to uh, uh, get some information out of these examples, uh, something in general that can help you in uh, performing data analysis uh, in, in your future work. So let's let's start with a real uh, case of data analysis first. So you see uh, on this uh, on on the screen, uh, you see um, uh, actually let me take a pointer if I can. Uh, you see that I have a picture of Mars, um, and uh, well, I can use this pointer here. I have a picture of Mars, and I would like you to tell me what you see in this picture. Uh, I can uh, do a bit of uh, data processing straight away. I enhanced version of this picture, and I highlight for you uh, what you should uh, focus your attention on. And uh, if you can, I would like you to use uh, the, the chat uh, so that um, you uh, you tell me what you see uh, right now in this picture, and then we comment on that. So I give you maybe you know a couple of minutes to to think and write in the chat what you see. And then maybe if Dimitra, if you can tell me, because I'm not sure I can see the chat. If you can tell me what people are writing, that's great. Okay, so people are writing, is it a valley, water, mm -hmm. channels? Fronts and cyclones, CO2 ice caps melting due yes. to solar flares. I see, I see the chat now, actually. <laughs> that's great. So let me move this window. All right. So that's that's absolutely fantastic. Um, valley, not quiet. Okay. But fronts and cyclones, yes. This is a really good question. And of course, you know, we see the CO2 ice cap. We see the CO2 ice cap, the white. Uh, um, Top of the picture is indeed a CO2 ice cap. Uh, but the one, the person, uh, uh, Jing Xiao, who answered the fronts and cyclones, he got it right. Uh, so what we see, uh, there are actually two dust storms, um, and there are two, two, these are two fronts, okay? Um, these are called uh, the, uh, uh, in meteorological terms, um, the uh, features that are elongated and the move, all right? Plus, you see a, a little cycle, a little vortex. So it means that there is dynamics going on. You know? There is dynamics because there is a front, so there is a wind moving the front. And there is also dynamics because there are, there are vortices, uh, in this particular case, uh, highlighted by the presence of dust, all right? So very good, very good uh, uh, data analysis, all right? Now, uh, let me show you uh, this, this other picture, which resembles uh, the one I showed you before, just to give you a more 
closer approach of what a dust storm uh, looks like and what a what a vortex looks like uh, on Mars. So this is probably not as good as uh, the picture uh, that uh, Dr. Tito has showed uh, before. That was very impressive and was a really, really nice uh, uh, way of uh, taking very high resolution um, uh, pictures on Mars. This is probably less impressive, but uh, at the same time, it shows you that on Mars, you have storms and you have uh, vortices. In other terms, you have meteorological events like on Earth, right? We have you know, hurricanes, we have tornadoes, we have uh, uh, dust storms as well. So there, are, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, meteorology on Mars and observations from satellites are trying, uh, uh, starting to unveil this, uh, this meteorology on the long term because we have now uh, you know, multiple Martian years of, of observations to, to analyze. So there's a lot of work for you guys there to, to do, and there will be even more when new spacecraft like EMM spacecraft will arrive. Okay, so from uh, uh, these kind of pictures, uh, images, like visible images, taken, for example, uh, by the uh, uh, Mars uh, orbital camera on board Mars Global Surveyor, or the Marsi camera on board the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, both uh, NASA spacecraft, people have deduced, uh, have visually looked uh, to places where uh, dust storms are located, and they compiled um, a very interesting data set, which is called the Mars Dust Activity Database. So these, these authors, Battaglia and Wong, uh, they first uh, processed uh, raw information, raw visible information from uh, the spacecraft, produced these um, uh, global view uh, pictures as you, as you see on the left hand side. And then by inspecting each uh, picture uh, every single day for uh, you know, 11 Martian years, not maybe less than 11 Martian years, but for a number of Martian years, they compiled a database where they record uh, the particular sol, the uh, solar longitude, the centroid longitude and centroid latitude and area, uh, of each uh, dust uh, event, all right? Some dust events are just a, a kind of popping up storm. Others are called sequences. Uh, and these are basically what we uh, generally refer to as dust storms, you know, events that continue in time and cover a large space. So it's a, it's a huge database, but obviously it's, it's a very interesting one because you have all the, um, dust storms, dust event recorded from local to regional to global uh, for, for all these Martian years. Now, this is a list of numbers, right? Uh, this is already a, a data reduction of uh, what you see in the images, but we can go further. We can do even more data reduction in our data analysis. And this is what Battalion Wong has done, have done. Uh, so you can uh, put on a map all the centroids all the longitude and latitude centroids uh, for, for these storms. And you clearly see that, for example, they accumulate in certain areas, not in the whole planet. And then you can, you can do a, a, a further analysis. You plot the number of uh, sequences or dust storms per year. And you see clearly that there is a kind of dust storm corridor, I would call it, uh, anal analogous, analogous to the US uh, uh, dust uh, bowl, if you, if you know what, what, what I mean. So uh, there's a corridor where there's, a, there's more probability that uh, you have a, a high number of uh, dust storms uh, every, every year. You know, you have 2.5 in this area here, going, going through this uh, topographic corridor, which is the Acidalia uh, corridor. All right. Now, this, um, if you want, is the kind of data analysis that you can do by using uh, um, images, right? This is another image. This is a Mars Global Surveyor mock image. It's, it's a, it's, it's a um, composite, but plotted as it was seen from an aerostationary orbit. The interesting thing is that when you do data analysis, you also want to um, put together different sources of, of data, uh, do what it's called data integration, okay? So here we have a visible image and now you know, I can record, I, mean, I can because I know, but I, I know there is a dust storm, which is highlighted 
in the circular in that's in partic that particular area. Uh, it's also uh, recorded in, uh, in the Battaglio and Wang's database. But I want to do more. I want to put some uh, qu quantitative information on the top of this qualitative image. And therefore, I use uh, a, a map of column dust optical depth. Okay, This basically tells you um, how much opacity there is in the air. And the opacity is proportional to the amount of dust uh, which, which is available. So with this information, with this couple of information, the visible image and the dust optical depth, at the same time, you have done a data integration. And now you see the dust storm uh, location and intensity uh, very clearly. So this is what you want to do ultimately when you, when you do data analysis. Don't just uh, uh, use one data set, but try to integrate more sources of data uh, so that you enhance your level of analysis. Now let's speak a bit, a bit more about uh, this data set, which is the, the column dust optical depth uh, data set. This is something that I, I produced, a product that I, I, um, I work on for, for many years now. So I used so far um, three NASA spacecraft, the Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Odyssey, and Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter. For future use, uh, uh, I, I always plan, but I don't have a lot of time to use uh, uh, Mars Express. Uh, TGO, uh, although uh, the particular instrument called ACS uh, has failed now, so we only have a limited record. And of course, uh, the future is going to be uh, EMM. Uh, the three NASA spacecraft are more like, and I will also do this and TGO, they are more like um, mapping spacecraft because they are in sun synchronous orbit. EMM is going to play the transition between what I call a mapping uh, towards what I call monitoring, because it, because of its orbit, it's going to see the, the, the planet uh, globally uh, much more frequently than other spacecraft. And then ultimately, the goal is to do a proper monitoring by using a, a sort of a geostationary satellite for, for Mars as uh, we, we are done on the Earth. But let's stay uh, for the time being, let's, let's keep the focus on this NASA orbiter. What is column dust optical depth? It's basically uh, the amount of opacity through the atmosphere. So the infraradiation is emitted from the surface. It goes through the, the atmosphere where there is dust. Dust has absorption and scattering. And uh, so some, uh, some radiation is lost. What is left and seen by the uh, spacecraft in uh, the view, for example, um, then can be converted into uh, opacity, which is this uh, parameter um, tau here, which is linked to the transmittance of the atmosphere. And uh, the opacity tau, the column opacity, is also uh, directly linked to the dust mixing ratio, so the amount of uh, dust or the mass of dust which is in the atmosphere. So by using uh, this, uh, this variable, okay, uh, what we can do is to um, reconstruct maps of dust uh, maps mean, meaning uh, plots of latitude, longitude uh, uh, plots that shows where uh, the dust is located, how it, it evolves, and trying to understand something about the dynamics behind the, the presence of uh, particular dust storms, like the, you know, the meteorology of the dust storm. And this is what I've done now for um, 11 Martian years, from Martian 24 to Martian 34. Uh, this is a data set which is available in the Mars Climate Database uh, webpage. Uh, there's a sub, uh, there's a, um, there's a sub page called Dust Climatology, uh, and you can download uh, all these uh, daily maps. Uh, these are numbers, I mean, they, they are, these are data, and then you have to use your own tool to transform into these uh, kind of nice maps. Uh, let me just point, uh, point out one thing. So originally, the data are more or less like on the left. So you, you see a, a sequences of uh, column opacities uh, derived from uh, uh, observations, uh, for example, in this case, by the uh, Mars Global Surveyor Thermal Emission Spectrometer Instrument, okay? But, but the observations, because it's a polar orbiter, so the observations are sparse and actually the, um, uh, the orbits move in longitude, okay? So what do you see out of this uh, dust storm uh, in a particular Martian year, a particular longitude, 
is is what you what you have on the left hand side and you have to do some i call it provocatively okay i call it magic all right so you do some magic and you obtain a a, a very nice smooth uh dust map every day all right uh, so that you can follow the evolution of the sun now it's not magic at all as you as you can understand uh there is a lot of um uh, mathematics and statistics uh, behind behind this, this methodology. So I don't have the time to go through the methodology itself, but the details are provided in these two papers, uh, probably even too, too many details. Uh, but if you want to know uh, exactly how uh, these things work, and if you want to work with this data, you have to know how the, the data has been, uh, has been built. Um, and I'll show you in a second why. Okay, um, let's move on to tell you that um, uh, I have uh, produced 11 Martian years worth of daily maps of dust, uh, of column dust optical depth. Okay. Uh, as I said, these are all available. A gridded version, which, uh, which has incomplete uh, uh, areas. Why incomplete? Because in these areas, we have no observations, okay, um, for, for different reasons. And then there is another version, which is called the Kriget one. So basically, it's interpolated. Uh, to provide a, a full uh, map uh, given certain assumptions. And these, this cricket version of these maps is what has been used in the Mars Klama database to produce what uh, Hewarn has uh, showed you uh, in, the, in the previous presentation, okay? So uh, one uh, warning that I would like to, to tell you straight away here is that whenever you use a data set for your data analysis, first know your data, know the data you're using, because uh, this is fundamental. You cannot just start with the data or start with a data set and do manipulate the data and get amazing results and then eventually discover, ah, oh, yes, but actually these data were not meant to do this or you know, there were limitations in the data. In this particular case, for example, know very well that um, uh, these, these data sometimes do not have real observations. If you, use, if you use, for example, the cricket maps, know that assumptions are, are provided uh, to, to, to do the interpolation, okay? So this, this is a very important advice that I give to all the students uh, uh, out there. Now, this is another example of uh, data reduction. We now have uh, um, all these nice maps, daily maps of column dust optical depth. How do we elaborate them? How to reduct, how to, re sorry, how, to re how do we reduce this data to, to, uh, to, to summarize the information in one plot that gives us some signs. One way to do is to take uh, the averages of all these maps uh, and maybe plot as a latitude on the y-axis and time or solar longitude on the x-axis. Okay, so this is exactly what it's re represented here. This is a multi-annual uh, zonal average of column dust optic optical depth using the maps that I showed you uh, before. And what can we see here now? We can see, for example, that there is an early peak in, uh, uh, in the opacity, okay? After a, a very quiet period, so uh, violet means very low dust, blue average dust, uh, yellow high dust, okay? So after a very quiet period, which is more or less like a half a year, a bit less than half a year, less than half a Martian year, you have a, a, a start of what we call uh, the dust storm season. So it's dust storm, big dust storms start, start to, to kick in. So you have a, a, an early increase of uh, uh, dust optical depth. And then when most of the large regional storms happen, you have a, a strong increase of uh, dust optical depth, uh, which we called, or I called, the main peak followed by a, a southern high latitude peak, because at this time, uh, the uh, CO2 ice cap in the south is, is sublimating. So there is a uh, dust exposed and winds which lift the dust and create dust storms in the, in the southern uh, uh, hemisphere around the cap. And uh, eventually you have a, a, late, a late peak, um, which again, uh, is, is showing as a, as a result of regional dust storms have, ha happening 
later in the year with, with a gap, okay? So let's just keep this in mind. There is a gap between the main peak and late peak. Now, that was a, 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 an example of data reduction. This is a, an example of uh, how to show interannual variability uh, out of this data. You see that, uh, well, you, you see basically what Ewan has already uh, very well explained, so I'm not spending more time on, on, this, uh, on, this, uh, on this picture. Uh, I just tell you that uh, we are currently marching at 35, and uh, I'm going to produce a, a very latest release uh, of the beta version of marching 35 in about a week or so. So we are up to date. This is a, an ongoing work, uh, which uh, aims to build a, a long-term uh, meteorolo meteorology uh, for, for uh, column dust optical depth on Mars. Now, what we want to do is also to understand, uh, all right, so what are these uh, uh, peaks? How are these peaks uh, in column opacity related to what really happens in terms of uh, dynamics of these dust storms? This is an interesting, uh, the ultimate interesting question. So here you have, uh, again, uh, this, this zona mean plot, but together I have a diagram that shows um, three things. Molar topography, Mars molar topography, okay? Um, some uh, fingerprint of uh, the, what we called Northern Winter Baroclinic waves, okay? Particularly, uh, uh, particularly um, showed as surface pressure, surface pressure anomaly, okay? And three arrows that uh, tells you what are the, uh, what we call the dust corridors, where it's most likely that dust storms um, occur uh, on Mars. So most of the, of the dust storms on Mars, and this is a result that has been, for example, showed by Wang uh, and Battaglio, most of the storms uh, are originated in these areas in the northern plains where these northern winter baroclinic waves are very active, similar to you know, the, the waves that we have at mid-latitudes on Earth. And then they move, they, they cross the equator, they move in the southern hemisphere where they spread around, okay? And they use preferentially these three corridors which correspond to, to this uh, you know, very nice uh, um, uh, wave tree uh, topography. Uh, structure. So these three corridors are called the Acidalia corridor, the Utopia corridor, and the Arcadia uh, corridor. And uh, if you remember the plot that I showed you at the beginning, okay, so this is just to, to tell you that these peaks correspond to storms initiated by this um, winter baroclinic wave uh, uh, um, uh, locations. Um, if, you even, if you remember the plot that I showed at the beginning, um, I showed you from this plot from Battaglio saying the most of the dust storms actually occur in, in this area. And this indeed corresponds to uh, the uh, Acidalia corridor. So what happens in between these two peaks? Well, this is called the solstitial pose, has been studied. Uh, we know more or less what happens here. It's probably the subject of another talk, uh, but it has something to do with um, the uh, formation of uh, CO2 clouds in the northern, over the northern polar region. But again, this is a very specific uh, uh, topic to be discussed, uh, maybe in, in a total, totally different talk. Now, what I want to tell you though, oh, is be... that, um... yeah, Dimitra? Yeah, you have three more minutes. Hello? Three more minutes, okay. So what I want to tell you in these three more minutes is that um, um, we want to know the uh, connection between what we see and the dynamics that uh, causes uh, what we observe. And we can do this by using a, a global climate model uh, as, the, uh, as the LMD one, but we can also add uh, our satellite observations and do it in a nice way using a process called data assimilation and that will combine a, a model with observations in a statistical rigorous and optimal, optimal way. And uh, ultimately you will have a, a, what we call an analysis of the uh, climate state, which also includes what is not directly observed. So we'll have, you will have information about the winds, for example, even if you didn't observe them, 
okay? And this uh, um, analysis is consistent with uh, the laws of physics and the uncertainties of both model and observations. So uh, this is another data set that you can use. Mars analysis simulation is uh, a uh, is exactly that. So it's a it's a reanalysis of multiple Martian years using uh, observations of temperature profiles and column dust optical depths from TESS. It's available online as well. So if you go to this uh, uh, web URL, then you click here, you have access directly to the to the raw data set. But otherwise, you can use the the plotter which is available. Okay. Um, so this is a difference with respect to MCD is that this is a, a meteorological data set. So every day is different, okay? And I'll show you why, for example, here we observe a, a storm uh, 10 days apart, okay? Here, this is a storm. And then you can plot, for example, the temperature change and the wind uh, change that occurs when the storm uh, is happening, okay? And as I, as I told you, as you can see clearly, you know, two days are totally different. The impact of this, the presence of the storm is that the temperature increases by about 10 uh, Kelvins and the uh, uh, near surface uh, meridional winds also increase. Now, um, not, uh, not everything can be done using, for example, the plotter that I showed you. Uh, it's not as sophisticated as the Mars Climate Database um, website. So you can take the raw data uh, and do your own analysis. Here, for example, uh, I'm showing exactly the same thing, uh, but I, I use the raw data to produce uh, vector plots. So this is another way of visualizing uh, uh, information. Uh, and um, the first plot is uh, days before the, the start of the storm. And uh, when I show you what happens 10 days later, you see that, for example, there is a very strong um, uh, jet or current moving from the northern plains uh, towards the equator and crossing it, which is the dynamics uh, behind why you see so many dust storms occurring in uh, this uh, uh, Acidalia corridor. Uh, that has been uh, highlighted by, for example, Battaglio and Wong and, and other people, okay? And by the way, uh, this uh, type of current uh, had already been discussed by Josh et al. Uh, 25 years ago, and now we are seeing it through the presence of dust storms. That's it. So I want just to make a few summary. We have discussed five instruments aboard three spacecraft, spacecraft being Mars Global Surveyor, Mars uh, Odyssey, and the Mars uh, Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, the instruments being Mock, Marcy, uh, TESS, um, and uh, Themis, and MCS. We discussed three types of data obtained from satellite observations, three publicly available data sets being um, the Battaglio Mars uh, Data uh, Activity data set, my uh, dust, uh, column dust optical death uh, meteorology, uh, and the uh, Magda uh, reanalysis as a data simulation. We discussed several methodologies of data reduction, several examples of data integration, one technique of data simulation, which is analysis correction, but there are many others. One used at UAU uh, by Roland, Dr. Roland, Roland Young, a different one, different technique and three techniques of data visualization. I stop here because I have a, myself, I have two questions for the audience. If there is any time, we, we can do the little uh, quiz. If not, I will take uh, people questions, which might be more important. Yeah, thanks a lot, Luca. Unfortunately, we don't have the time anymore for a quiz. No problem. We, maybe in the next workshop. We Absolutely. Can, uh, yeah, do that. So thank, sure. thank you, Luca. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating in this, for giving presentations. Um, so uh, let us hear a few words from uh, Srini. Yeah, uh, I want to thank the speakers, but maybe make uh, one or two, one remark and ask a question. Um, the remark is that part of the excitement in UAE and uh, at our center is the 
hope arbiter, which I mentioned already, and uh, Dimitra mentioned it, and uh, many of the speakers mentioned it. I, I should mention that another name for that is uh, Emirati, uh, Emirates Mars mission, which is something that uh, we probably uh, uh, did not mention. The uh, mission design, development, and uh, operation has been led by the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center uh, in UAE. And it has been developed in collaboration with a number of universities, uh, University of Colorado, Berkeley, and Arizona State University, etc. And uh, NYU Abu Dhabi uh, works with them in many, in many fronts. Um, I just wanted to make this remark, which um, uh, maybe is known to everybody. And the question I have is, uh, if I really want to look at the data, can I uh, look at, log on to the website, uh, looking at the, uh, the address you have given at the bottom of your slide? Absolutely, yes. And you, can, uh, uh, you uh, obviously the, uh, the data are organized in some uh, convenient way. And you and uh, the previous speaker explained a little bit of uh, that organization. But how um, much of raw data access is available? So you, you are, you're pointing uh, uh, something which is very important as well. You know, I, I talk about data integration, data reduction, data yeah, visualization, yeah, data sure. simulation. There's another, there's another important aspect, which is data curation, okay? Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. as the producers of this data, we have to have the resources, human resources, you know, funding resources, to, to keep these uh, uh, databases uh, working. So of course, we, uh, when we start, we start creating a database, we come up with uh, you know, the best uh, possible you know, type of uh, files that which is uh, commonly shared. Uh, we, we try our best uh, to, to make it as simple as possible to be read by, by any possible software, but, but it's, not, it's never going to be the case. So it's only through users experience that we understand how to improve, uh, uh, how to make it uh, simpler and simpler. Uh, there is a limitation though. Uh, up to a certain point, we can make effort to, uh, you know, make these databases uh, easily to use. But then <laughs> from that point onwards, it's up to the user, as I said probably before, to get used to the data, understand how the data are built, and then, and then use them uh, uh, properly, right? Um, so let's say, uh, uh, sorry, you, you go ahead, yeah. No, no, I, th I think I done that. So please go ahead. Uh, I think uh, uh, you have one had a comment, yeah. Um, uh, basically as a newcomer to the field, let's say I want to um, get into this. Obviously, I can access your data, <clears throat> which has been uh, processed already and put in usable form, yeah. and I can use it for my own purposes. <coughs> but if I really want to go into um, deeper issues, maybe I'll be able to look at the, uh, look at the uh, raw data and be able to manipulate them myself. Uh, I don't know if that is possible or not possible. I'm using me as an example. I don't mean me myself. Uh, I don't know how, what level of uh, detail the data are accessible to a, a user outside the outside your uh, group, for instance. Yes. You know, I mean, uh, if somebody comes and knows nothing about Mars, obviously, you know, it cannot just no. pick up this data and, and, and use them. Because no. although we make all possible effort to re reduce the data, do data reduction ourselves, you know, there is, there is a limit, you know, we, we have to produce a data set which is uh, uh, good for everybody at every different levels. So one way to do, for example, if a student comes to me saying, I want to use your data, uh, I say, Absolutely, they are free, they are publicly available. Uh, but then the question is, how does the student know about Mars, about the yeah. data? How yeah. much time is he spending in understanding this data? 
And then the other, if you want, the other question is, can I, uh, can I follow the student, you know, myself or somebody else who knows the data? Can we facilitate the work of a student? Yeah. We can. Uh, right now, I have a, a master student at the UAU, and we are indeed uh, using uh, uh, the Batalios uh, data set and my uh, DAS map, trying to do real data analysis and you know move forward to to do uh, to do to do research. Uh, but it takes in, indeed it takes time because, yeah. Well, every student has to get used to uh, to, to has to get experience. Uh, so the, one the, one. Uh, what I was hoping. Can, Hey, yeah, thank you. Yeah. If I can say something, just so experience can be gained by, uh, you know, trying and making mistakes. Okay. Which is one perfect good way to do it. Uh, otherwise, uh, it can be obtained by following a certain program uh, and then being uh, cultivated by, uh, by somebody who has experience in this data. So this, this then becomes a question of how to organize uh, you know, workshops like these that can be effective into uh, providing more information about, uh, you know, practicalities of how to use these data and so on and so forth. It's not an easy process, I understand, because, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not easy data uh, anyway. One thing is making them available and one thing is know how to use them, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's great. You're welcome. All right then, thank you all. Thank you everyone uh, for giving such uh, wonderful talks. Thank you to all the participants. I hope this was useful and uh, keep in touch. Uh, go to our Center for Space Science website to see what we are doing. If you want to get involved, yeah, write to us and we'll see you uh, next year with a new workshop. So thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you, bye. Thank you for inviting us. Thank bye -bye. you for the presentation. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dimitra. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gita. Yeah, take care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Dimitri. Bye-bye, Luca. Yeah, bye-bye.